University of Toronto. Um, he studied in Germany, uh, specifically Aachen, Germany, as well as uh, did medical school at Harvard Medical School. Um, he did his residency training back in in Germany, as well as completed a neurointerventional fellowship with Professor Pierre Lajunias in Paris, France. Uh, then afterwards, in 2008, he returned back to University of Toronto um, for diagnostic and interventional neuroradiology. Uh, he remains clinically active, as well as involved in research, uh, primarily focused on neurovascular diseases, as well as imaging. He's published over 500 peer-reviewed articles, 30 book chapters, and four books on interventional neuroradiology. Uh, he's won many awards um, for his uh, outstanding teaching, and uh, we are excited to hear what he has to uh, share with us today on spine vascular malformations, specifically related to classifications and management. Uh, again, thank you, Dr. Krinks, for joining us. And uh, thank you very much uh, for the very kind uh, introduction. I'll just uh, share my screen here. Uh, hope you can see my screen and my laser pointer. Yes, we can. Okay, so we can go ahead. So it's a relatively esoteric theme, spinal vascular malformations. Uh, it's a rare disease, uh, obviously, uh, but uh, given its rarity, I think it's important to understand how we best can manage it. And we start off with uh, classification. And there's the joke about uh, classific uh, classifications of spinal vascular malformations that there are actually more classifications out there than there are diseases to be classified. And um, uh, what we will try to go through in the first part uh, of the talk is a classification that is based on imaging characteristics, where uh, we first have to have a look uh, of uh, whether or not a shunt is present in a suspected spinal vascular malformation. And so I will now discuss with you how I approach uh, uh, like spinal vascular malformation to be able to classify them and then to be all, uh, able uh, to um, move ahead with uh, potential treatment managements. So how can we identify whether or not a shunt is present if we have a suspected spinal vascular malformation? If a shunt is present, we would see arterialization of the venous network, which means that the veins are dilated and this is always more pronounced dorsally, simply because uh, the, uh, on the dorsal surface, the uh, perimedullary veins are a subarachnoid as compared to the ventral surface, where the veins are located within the central sulcus, i.e. subpile. And this will be of importance when we are talking about slow flow vascular malformations, and it will be uh, of importance when we are trying to understand why, for example, in spinal dural vascular malformations, we will always see more pronounced veins on the dorsal surface as compared to the ventral surface. Arterialization of the venous network, dilatation of veins. And here's a classical example where we see too many dilated vessels over the dorsal surface that demonstrate some enhancement here on the T1-weighted sequences. And depending on the flow volume, i.e. whether you have a high flow shunt versus a low flow shunt, you will be able to see those dilated vessels more or less pronounced. So in the high flow shunts, you can obviously see many and significantly dilated vessels, whereas in low flow shunts, you may only see like a trickle of abnormal dilated vessels. And then it will become more difficult. So for example, in this patient here, we see widespread cord edema, and the dorsal surface is not completely smooth and clean. You see like a little bit like of irregularities there, but there's no true enhancement there. So we were in equipoise for this particular patient, whether this patient had a spinal dural uh, or spinal vascular malformation or not. Likewise, uh, 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 in, in these types of patients, we will need additional aids, additional help to identify whether or not a shunt is present. And together with uh, Richard Farb from our group here, we developed a technique which is called dynamic MR angiography, uh, or TRIX MRI, uh, MRA, a time-resolved uh, MRA that allows us to identify whether or not a shunt is present. And this time-resolved MRA is based on the fact that we are uh, looking at the spinal vasculature in an arterial phase, in an arterial phase, we should see at every single 
level, just one segmental vessel, i.e. the artery, going towards the uh, um, uh, uh, towards the vertebral body. In the second phase, which is a combined arterial and venous phase, we would uh, see then at every single level two vessels, i.e. one artery and one vein uh, on each uh, of the sides. So if we are using this time-resolved MRA and we are already seeing in the early phase, i.e. in the arterial phase, a venous structure being filled, as in this example here, you know that this patient has to have an arteriovenous shunt. So in those patients where we are kind of in equipoise, whether or not a shunt is present, where the veins are only mildly dilated, as a very good non-invasive technique, MRA can be used to identify whether or not a shunt is present. Here we have another example where on imaging we thought that there may be a couple of dilated vessels here. And now you can, of course, do a full like 31 times 2 vessel angiography to look at all of the segmental arteries, whether or not a shunt is present. Or you can simply do an MRA and see that in the first or arterial phase, there's no evidence for any venous drainage. So we do know that in this patient, there's no evidence for an arteriovenous shunt. The other way that we can identify it is uh, the way that we were taught by Pierre Lajeunias uh, in the old days, i.e. by looking at your uh, Adamkovich artery. If you inject during your uh, um, uh, evaluation on DSA, the segmental artery that harbors the uh, Adamkovich artery, the anterior spinal artery contributor, and you see that the contrast stagnates into the late venous phase within the anterior spinal artery, then you know that there is no evidence for an arteriovenous normal transition. And this is an indirect sign that somewhere else there has to be an arteriovenous shunt that prevents the blood flow from going from the arterial into the venous phase. So stasis in the anterior spinal artery is always a sign for a shunt being present elsewhere. And here's uh, the massive arteriovenous shunt that led to venous congestion of this patient. So in our algorithm, our first question is, is a shunt present, yes or no? Look at dilated vessels, use non-invasive MRA, dynamic MRA, and have a look at your ASA injection, whether there's stasis in the vessel. This will help you to identify whether or not a shunt is present. Okay, once a shunt is present, we'll now have to identify which vessel it is that is feeding the shunt. And there are multiple different vessels that we know, and we'll have to now briefly, very briefly, go into the spinal vascular anatomy. I know that there was an excellent talk just a couple of weeks ago on spinal vascular anatomy. Just to briefly recapitulate, at every single segmental level, we have a segmental artery that will supply the bone, the dura, the nerve root, the muscles, and the ribs. At some levels we may have, in addition to the supply to the bone, dura, and nerve root, also a supply ascending along the nerve root towards uh, the spinal cord. And this can go either posterior, that would be a radiculopyal artery that goes towards the posterior spinal artery, or it would be anterior, i.e. that would be a radiculomedullary artery, that enters with this hairpin curve into the anterior spinal artery. And depending on where the shunt is located, we may have dural feeders that feed the shunt, then we would have a dural arteriovenous fistula. Or we have can have pile feeders, then you would have a pile arteriovenous shunt. Or you can have a radiculomedullary feeder, then you would have a true uh, arteriovenous malformation of the spine. So to recapitulate the, briefly the anatomy in this newborn within the injection, you can see at every single segmental level, we have an artery that will supply the vertebral body, that will supply the ribs, that will supply the nerve roots. And at some levels, which are unpredictable, there's an additional supply 
that makes this hairpin curve that goes along with the nerve root towards the spinal cord. And this would be a spinal cord supply. So on each level, a segmental artery, and from a variable level, supply to the spinal cord. The anterior spinal artery uh, axis is reinforced at multiple different levels, uh, on average six different levels. And these different levels are unpredictable. They can be anywhere, typically uh, from the vertebral artery. They can come also from the ascending and from the deep cervical artery. Um, you can classically have at least one or two feeding arteries for the cervical intumescence. And we have uh, classically one or two feeding artery for the lumbar intumescence, of which the great radiculomedullary artery, the so-called artery of Adamkovich, is the major feeder for the lower portion of uh, the spinal uh, uh, cord for the anterior spinal artery. The anterior spinal artery then uh, has multiple small vessels, the so-called salcocommissural arteries, that will supply the gray matter uh, in a radiculofugal pattern. And on the surface of the cord, we have the posterior spinal artery that give rise to radiculopile arteries that supply the cord in a radiculo petal pattern uh, that will supply and that will interconnect with the anterior spinal artery via the vasa corona branches, which are uh, demonstrated here. And this will be of importance later when we're speaking about spinal vascular intramedullary malformation that uh, may be supplied by both the anterior and the posterior spinal artery by salcocommissural penetrating artery that interconnect through the cord, the anterior spinal artery axis with the posterior spinal cord uh, axis. And then we have those connections between the posterior spinal cord axis and the anterior spinal cord axis that are on the surface. This would be the vasa corona branches that interconnect both vascular systems. The arterial supply to the cord and to the bone, uh, adjacent bone, and that allows an analogy with the brain, which will help us to subclassify the major types of arteriovenous malformations that we can identify. Similar to the brain, we have arteries that supply the bone, the muscle, and the dura. In the brain, of course, this would be the middle meningeal artery, the occipital artery, etc., i.e. branches of the external carotid artery. And we have those arteries that supply the central nervous system in the cord, the radiculomedullary and the radiculopile arteries in the central nervous system, the ICA, the ACA, the MCA, etc. If you have a shunt that is fed by arteries that would normally supply the brain, you call it a brain AVM or pile arteriovenous malformation. If in the brain, you have a shunt that is supplied by arteries that would normally supply the bone, the muscle, or the dura, you have a dural arteriovenous fistula. And the same holds true now for the spine. If you have a vascular malformation that is supplied by an artery that would normally supply the cord, then you have a pile arteriovenous malformation that is fed by arteries that would normally supply the spinal cord as compared to those vascular malformations in the spine that are fed by arteries that would normally supply the dura or the nerve root, then you have a dural arteriovenous fistula with retrograde drainage towards spinal cord veins, thereby leading to venous congestion of the cord, similar to the congestion of, uh, the, core, uh, of the brain that you can have in dural arteriovenous fistula of the brain that have cortical venous reflux. Therefore, your main next step in differentiation is, what is the feeding artery? Do you have a radiculomeningeal artery or do you have a radiculomedullary feeder? And how can we differentiate this? Well, the arteries that supply the cord run in the first segment straight up along with the nerve root to reach either the anterior surface or the posterior surface. So the radiculomedullary and radiculopeal arteries will always be straight in the first segment and have an ascending curve. 
The veins on the other side do not have to follow the nerve roots and they are often more tortuous, which means that in these two vascular malformations, patient one, patient two, the feeding artery towards the draining vein is here not going along a nerve root, but it is entering right here a very tortuous and horizontal vessel, indicating that this vessel here is already the draining vein that then hooks up to the perimedullary veins here, because it is reaching the surface, not along with the nerve root. So we know that this here has to be therefore a dural arterivenous shunt with the fistulous point typically underneath the pedicle of the segmental artery. Whereas in this patient where we have abnormal dilated perimedullary veins here, the artery that goes towards those abnormal veins is actually having a straight course along with the nerve root and makes a hairpin curve typically for your anterior spinal artery and then dives into the abnormal network right here. So we know that this has to be a uh, like true AVM, whereas this is a dural arteriovenous fistula. This is dural, this is pyre. So if we have now gotten to the next step of our evaluation, if you have identified that the feeding artery is a radiculomeningeal artery, you have your diagnosis. You know that this patient harbors a dural arteriovenous shunt. And now, before we move on with the classification scheme, let's talk a little bit about spinal dural arteriovenous fistula so that I do not only bore you with classification, but that we actually delve into also a little bit of management of these types of diseases. Spinal dural arteriovenous fistula, to recapitulate, are shunts that are supplied by radiculomeningeal arteries, i.e. arteries that are not necessarily feeding the cord, uh, and that are draining, uh, that are drained by perimedullary veins. So it is an artery that classically uh, goes towards uh, the uh, nerve root, and typically the shunt is located right underneath the pedicle uh, where the uh, meningeal artery enters or pierces through the dura. Often there's a small network of abnormal feeding vessels, and they interconnect with uh, now uh, your veins. They uh, go back towards the cord and at the level of the cord lead to venous congestion. As we all know, spinal dural arteriovenous fistula are a disease of elderly male patients. Patients have progressive neurological symptoms uh, and if left untreated, uh, this can lead to paraplegia. Because it's elderly male patients and because the problems are very widespread, there are lots of differential diagnoses and they are often um, these diseases are often overlooked. Patients may be treated for prostate problems. May, patients may be treated for spinal stenosis. And it is the role of the radiologist to actually identify the hallmark imaging findings of spinal dural AV fistula, which are not only the abnormal dilated veins, more prominent uh, dorsally, but also cord edema. So what about this patient? This was a relatively young patient, approximately 40 years old, who presented with uh, neck pain. And on imaging, yes, we see a couple of uh, 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 cord uh, or a couple of disc protrusions here, but we also see abnormal vessels, but there's no edema. And this patient intrigued us because clearly he has a spinal vascular malformation, but how come he's non-symptomatic? So when we looked at the angio, you can see that the patient has a classical dural arteriovenous fistula. Here's the draining vein, the very tortuous course uh, reaching the cord surface here. But then what happens with the drainage is that relatively early on, it drains out into the uh, uh, like plexus surrounding the cord into and via radicular veins into the esophagus and the hemiesophagus system. And therefore, there is actually no congestion of this patient's cord because the venous hypertension is released very early on. But what would now happen if this radicular vein with age thrombosis or fibrosis and shuts down? Well, what would happen is now this dural arteriovenous fistula has no outflow 
and therefore the patient would have venous congestion and would become symptomatic. And so what we can know and learn from asymptomatic spinal dural arteriovenous fistula is how patients become symptomatic. Here another example, abnormal vessels, no cord at least into the, uh, um, uh, in, via the radicular, uh, radicular veins, thereby preventing the cord from being congested. From an imaging perspective, in the symptomatic dural arteriovenous shunts, we see the abnormally dilated paramedullary vessels as flow voids with contrast enhancement. We can see cord edema, that is T2 hyperintense. We can see contrast enhancement as a sign for long-standing venous congestion. And we may see a T2 hypointense rim for deoxyhemoglobin in the periphery. Due to the arterialization of the venous network, there's an increased intramedullary water content, an increased intramedullary pressure, which will prevent your normal arterial flow from going from the arteries through the capillary beds into the vein, simply because you have a downstream arterialization of the vein, and therefore your, uh, uh, there's no arteriovenous gradient any longer, and thus you'll have this venous congestion, which will lead to T2 hyperintensity, the stagnation of contrast will lead to the T2 hypo-intense uh, hypo rim, and uh, chronic ischemia is seen by T1 hyperintensity within the cord, which is a prognostic poor parameter of these patients. Now, how do we manage spinal dural arteriovenous fistulas? My personal management has somewhat changed over the years. Um, when I was all the way back in Aachen uh, with an excellent neurosurgeon, Professor Gielsbach, uh, there nearly all of our uh, dural arteriovenous fistula were treated with open surgery. Then I went to Pierre Lajunias, uh, where uh, uh, all of the spinal dural AV fistula workup were done under general anesthesia, which meant that, well, in order to save the patient another anesthesia session, he tried to, at the same time, treat all of the patients via an endovascular route, and only if he was not successful did we go for surgery. And in recent years, I personally have changed my management, and I will show you uh, why. If you want to go for an endovascular management, your uh, goal has to be to get with the microcatheter as close as possible to the shunting zone, inject your a dilute liquid embolic agent, and you need to reach with your uh, liquid embolic agent all the way into the vein. So this patient here, where your liquid embolic agent went from the artery all the way to the vein through the shunting zone, is cured. However, our success rates with cure, uh, with uh, embo cure, are actually only in the range, even in the best hands of 50 to 60%. That's not a good cure rate, especially if you know that open surgery has cure rates of close to 100%. So we looked at our data and found that whether or not you are able to cure with endovascular means depends on the arteriovenous transition. We have here four different patients and uh, with dural arteriovenous fistulas, and we all see here microcatheter injections just prior to the shunting zone. If you have a direct fistulous shunting zone, as in this example, your cure rates are very high because you can push your liquid embolic agent easily through the arteriovenous connection. If, on the other hand, you have a situation like in this case or in this case, where there is an abnormal network of vessels prior to reaching the vein right here, or prior to reaching the vein right here, then your likelihood of being successful in embolization is much lower. So in this case here, where we had the direct transition, you could see that the glue cast had no trouble getting into the vein here. This patient is cured. As compared to this patient who has a network of abnormal vessels prior to reaching the vein right here, we went in there, but the glue stopped dead prior to reaching the vein. This patient will need to undergo surgery because this dural arteriovenous fistula will come back. As with any other ligation embolization, 
if you're not reaching the vein, the shunt will come back and will actually make the life of the surgeon more difficult. And then we had this very humbling experience that made me uh, actually now move away from endovascular treatment as my first option for the majority of patients with dural arteriovenous fistulas. Here we had a patient where we see the dural arteriovenous fistula, we see the perimedullary veins here that lead to venous congestion. But there's something else we see here too, and that is that there is an anterior spinal artery with the hairpin curve right here at the same level where we have also the shunting zone, which is a classical contraindication for endovascular treatments because there's a high risk that you push your liquid embolic agent not only into the vein but also into the Adamkovich artery, thus leading to spinal cord ischemia. So we sent the patient to surgery, the surgery went very well. We did a post-operative surgical evaluation. And on post-operative uh, surgical evaluation, we see these images. We see that the shunt is cured. Excellent job by the surgeons. We see that the anterior spinal artery is preserved. Excellent. But we also see a posterior spinal artery arising from the same level as the anterior spinal artery and as the fistula. And even in retrospect, you don't see this posterior spinal artery, which means that if the shunt flow is so significant that all the contrast goes into your shunt, you may overlook cord supply, especially if the cord supply is minuscule. And this very humbling experience where really we did not see a spinal cord supply prior to embolization or prior to a potential embolization that we did not do simply because we did see another cord supply, led me to think about surgery being actually the first option in patients with spinal dural arteriovenous fistula, unless the spinal dural arteriovenous fistula is located really low down, i.e. at the level of, let's say, the sacrum, at the L4 level, at the L5 level, because it's rare, if not unheard of, that you can find cord supply from these lower lumbar or from the sacral levels. So here we had a recent example of a patient uh, with a spinal dural arteriovenous fistula that was fed by this really like by this iliolumbar artery, i.e. from the sacral level. And in this area here, there cannot be any supply to the cord. So we know this can be treated safely with an endovascular approach. Of course, it can also be treated safely with surgery, but these are the cases where we consider after multidisciplinary conference, also an endovascular option. You can see the microcatheter here. You can see uh, the glue cast here going all the way into the vein, and this patient is cured without the necessity for open surgery. Here, another example where we found the fistula very subtle coming up right here. There's the draining vein, and we found it to come from the L4 segment. So here's the segmental artery. Here we go underneath the pedicle. And here we have the fistulous zone with the draining vein right there. And here we can see now our microcatheter being present just in front of the fistula, our glue cast reaching the vein. At this level, there is no cord supply, so we can do this relatively safely. We see the glue going all the way into the vein. And this patient could be cured via an endovascular means. And here's again the glue cast. So what is our current approach, therefore, at our hospital regarding treatment of dural AV fistula? We do a time-resolved MRA. This will help us to identify whether or not there's a spinal dural AV fistula. It will help us to pinpoint whether it's like a high one or a low one. For the low lumbar and the sacral ones, we do GSA under GA and embolize. If we have a thoracic one or an upper lumbar one, 
We do DSA just under local to verify the location for the surgeon. We classically put a coil into the distal vessel for surgical localization, and then we go for open surgery. Okay, now let's move back into our classification scheme because we still have to identify what to do with those fistulas or those shunts that are fed by radiculomedullary arteries. Here we now have as the next step to differentiate what is the transition and where is the transition between the artery and the vein. Is it a direct fistula, i.e. a direct arteriovenous communication, or is it an abnormal network of vessels, i.e. a nidus type? So here we have a fistulous one, where there's a direct connection between the artery and the vein, whereas this one would be a nidus type AVM. And again, uh, this will allow us an, an analogy to the brain. Yeah, another uh, nidus type here uh, with an abnormal glomus. In the brain, we can have direct arteriovenous fistulas, and we can have the nidus type AVMs. And the nidus type AVMs are classically embedded in the brain, whereas the fistulous ones are on the surface of the brain. So therefore, when we use this analogy now for the spine, your fistulous vascular malformations will be perimedullary in location, whereas your nidus type AVMs will be located intramedullary in location. So therefore, fistulous ones are perimedullary, nidus types intramedullary. They can have like an extramedullary component, but their main like location is intramedullary. So therefore, we now have the nidus versus the fistulous ones. And then in the last step of our uh, algorithm of uh, 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 like classification, we can now identify whether we have a slow flow or a high flow shunt. And this will allow us to sub-differentiate into the micro and macro fistulas. And this will be of importance because the macro fistulas are often associated with either HHT, hereditary hemorrhagic teleinjectasia, or RASA1 mutations. So, uh, and they are more uh, common in uh, the pediatric age group. In the macro fistulas, we can see ulceration of the bone, high flow shunts with large in the ectetic uh, venous pouches. Whereas in the microfistulas, you can even have a situation where we don't even see a vein. How is this possible? Well, here is a patient with an intramedullary bleed, but no dilated vessels. In our experience, whenever there is an intramedullary bleed in the court, we do perform, um, uh, unless it's a known cavernoma, we do perform a spinal angiography. Because if the microfistula is going into the ventral spinal vein, that is, as you remember, subpile in location, deep in the ventral sulcus, you may not be able to see the dilated veins. And lo and behold, this is exactly what we saw here. Anterior spinal artery goes into a shunt right here where we have a focal aneurysm, but the drainage is only in the ventral spinal vein and these shunts may be overlooked on conventional MRI. So therefore, our current classification is we have the dural arteriovenous fistulas as compared to the pile arteriovenous shunts. The shunts can be uh, subdifferentiated into the nidus type and the fistulous ones and the fistulous ones into the micro and the macro fistulas. These are perimedullary, these are intramedullary, and these are obviously dural in location. Now, Let's talk about management of the pile arteriovenous shunts. As I said, these are shunts that are fed by arteries that would normally supply the cord. They are drained by spinal cord veins, and they get symptomatic by either hemorrhage or venous congestion, or by even compression. So here we have three different types of vascular malformations of the cervical spine. This became symptomatic due to venous congestion. This patient bled. And this patient had mass effect. And how can we differentiate this? Well, by using, for example, diffusion tensor imaging. With diffusion tensor imaging, you can see 
whether there's, for example, a focal hemorrhage that will lead to uh, apparent disruption of your fibers. You can see whether there's venous congestion that will lead to spreading of the fibers, or you can see whether there's mass effect that will lead to compression of the fibers. What is the natural history of spinal pile artivenous shunt? Do we need to treat an unruptured pile artivenous shunt? And in order to identify this, we'll have to look at the literature. There are three major articles, uh, one from the Chinese group uh, where I reviewed uh, their outcomes, one from the Toronto group and this meta-analysis. And what these uh, uh, um, articles demonstrated is that the annual hemorrhage rate of a hemorrhagic AVM is approximately 4% before treatment. If it is a rupture that is not treated, it will go up in the first year up to 10%. Rates for obliteration are better for surgery as compared for endovascular treatment. But the interesting finding of this meta-analysis was that um, despite these discrepant findings, even with partial treatment, the rates of subsequent hemorrhage were significantly uh, were, were similar. Now, when we looked at our data, we found the main difference between um, uh, nidus type and fistulous one, uh, that we can get a complete obliteration in the fistulous shunts via endovascular means only in a significantly higher percentage as compared to the nidus type, and that most fistulous type artivenous shunts improved as compared to, to the nidus type. In our series of um, uh, more than 80 cases that we followed over a long period in time, we had the following re-bleeding rates after presentation with hemorrhage, approximately 5% per year if the patient was not treated, 3% per year if the patient was partially treated, and only zero if there was complete treatment. When we looked at the Chinese series, we could estimate uh, the prevalence. It's a rare disease, as I said. We could identify that they either present with hemorrhage or due to congestion, i.e. either acute or gradual deterioration. The risk for rebleed was higher in their group, i.e. 10% per year if the presentation was with a bleed. But the sad findings were that if you had a congestive i.e. gradual deterioration, then patients were likely, i.e. with a rate of 20% per year, to progressively deteriorate. We also found in this very large uh, series that uh, complication rates for treatment are in the range of 10%, and this is, this is really with experienced hands. Important also to notice is there is no data on asymptomatic spinal uh, pile artivenous shunt, so we will have to be careful when we try to deduce the natural history. And I personally am very reluctant to treat an asymptomatic spinal arteriovenous malformation. If we have a hemorrhagic AVM, we should, however, treat, because more often than not, do we see a focal weak spot. And this may not be apparent on your normal DSA, but on your 3D, you can more often than not see a focal aneurysm that is the culprit for the patient's uh, vascular uh, or uh, symptomatic hemorrhage. Here we had a patient who presented with a hemorrhage. We can see the abnormal flow voids. We did a DSA, AP, and lateral. We see the ASA and the PSA coming in this patient from the same segmental artery. And we see a focal aneurysm right here, right there. Where is this located? Well, it is located at an artery that interconnects the anterior spinal artery with the posterior spinal artery. The AVM is located on the spinal uh, posterior surface, so therefore it would be a good surgical candidate. But the aneurysm is located in the depths of the cord because it's located right smack in the midline. And the only artery that interconnects the anterior spinal artery with the posterior spinal artery at the midline are the sulcocommissural arteries. And these would be very difficult for the surgeon to get. So in this case, we approach this patient by a dual approach, i.e. we first treated 
the aneurysm via endovascular means, and then the surgeon went ahead and treated the AVM via open surgery. Here's just the 3D of the same patient. Here we had a patient who presented with a subarachnoid hemorrhage. We see abnormal vessels over the cord surface. We see a nidus type AVM that is fed by the posterior spinal artery. In this case here, we see the continuation of the posterior spinal artery right here to the basket. So uh, we tried an exploration by a microcatheter you can see the microcatheter right here, but there's still the continuation of the posterior spinal artery here. So we are not in a safe position right here. We need to be able to hook now the microcatheter into the AVM. And here we have the microcatheter injection hooked into the AVM. These are only abnormal vessels. This is a safe position to embolize. In this symptomatic patient, we therefore went uh, for embolization and treated this patient where you can see nicely here the uh, uh, AVM being filled with glue and the AVM being cured uh, uh, and no longer filling here also on follow-up. Not only, not often are you this lucky to completely cure a nidus type AVM, but still endovascular treatments may play a role as uh, highlighted in this recent case where we had an AVM at the cervical medullary junction that had presented with an acute hemorrhage. We can see at least one aneurysm right here, and the lesion was deemed non-surgical resectable. When we did the angiography, you could see that there were indeed two aneurysms, one here and one here, coming from the anterior spinal artery here. And you can see that the anterior spinal artery continued right there down. And so we had a very small security margin, as we can see here with the microcatheter pointing more medially, we see the anterior spinal artery. And with the microcatheter now pointing more laterally, we see the aneurysm. So we felt that given that we had those two aneurysm right here, uh, we needed to treat those. So I injected some glue here. You can see the glue injection. We preserved the anterior spinal artery. A portion of the AVM was still filling, and uh, we are still now uh, discussing whether we can do gamma knife actually for this patient or what other alternatives we have in this uh, case. But uh, the patient at least did not re bleed. Here we have another patient, and now we are moving from the nidus type to the fistulous ones. The fistulous ones are more easy to treat. You can see in this case, we have the anterior spinal artery here. There's a focal aneurysm and there's a draining vein right here with the nidus or with a, like an arteriovenous transition right here. These are my working projections. You can see the anterior spinal artery going up and down. The hairpin curve is here. You can see a sulcocommissural artery here and the arteriovenous transition right here with a draining vein going up and one draining vein going uh, down uh, like here and here. So in this case, it is difficult uh, to get into uh, this from a surgical perspective, but from an endovascular perspective, uh, you can get into this sulcocommissural artery. Uh, as you can see here, there's the Magic 1.2, and here we are in the sulcocommissural artery. Here's the transition of your anterior spinal artery here and here, and we are just in front of uh, this AVM. Here's the glue cast where we can see nicely that the venous pouch is filled and here we have the follow-up with the anterior spinal artery being preserved and even the sulcocommissural artery here being preserved and the patient woke up fine. Another example for those fistulous ABMs, because in, again, in most cases, they are good endovascular targets. You see the microcatheter just in front of the fistulous compartment here. And here you see in real time now the glue injection. We go from the artery right here into the vein. And in the moment where we are in the vein, we suck a little bit of the glue back and pull the entire system out. Uh, and this is the follow-up with the AVM being cured. Another example here of an arteriovenous transition uh, of a fistulous type AVM. This is your continuation of the anterior spinal artery. The arteriovenous transition is where we have um, uh, the caliber change, i.e. from here to here. So your security margin is uh, this submillimeter segment of uh, the uh, anterior spinal artery. 
you go in there with your microcatheter. This is the microcatheter injection. Here's the glue injection in real time. You can see that we are wedged against the wall and that we are now injecting this mushroom-shaped glue into the pouch. And in the moment where glue is in the pouch, as it is thrombogenic, we are able to cure the uh, ABM. Here another fistulous ABM direct transition. Now we are going more into the macro fistulas. Um, and you can see here the result following treatment with remodeling and uh, the complete uh, obliteration of the shunt. Final, I think final example here, glue cast, direct arteriovenous transition, and uh, the patient uh, has been cured. Another example here, arteriovenous transition, Here's the glue cast, and this is the follow-up with the preservation of the anterior spinal artery. Now, when you look at this case here, you can see that um, the glue was only deposited in the first or initial venous pouch to be able to uh, preserve the anterior spinal artery. And sometimes your security margin is so small that you may be wary to do this. And then in these rare cases, as in this example here, we went into the first venous pouch with a microcatheter and actually coiled this first venous pouch, thus leading to obliteration of the shunt. That's unconventional, and but you can do it if you are able to completely obliterate the artery venous transition at its first segment. And this is the follow-up of this patient with the complete obliteration of the previously noted shunt. Okay, um, let's very briefly talk about the final components of uh, the classification. What if there's no shunt and you have a vascular malformation? Well, then it's not an endovascular treatment. Then you obviously have a spinal cavernoma. Here are two different examples of spinal cavernomas. But then we have these rare cases. So in this patient here, we see a bleed. So we suspect a spinal vascular malformation. We don't see abnormal vessels, which is also still okay because it may be a cavernoma. It may be a slow flow vascular malformation, but we see, do see a little bit of contrast enhancement right here. And on angiography, we saw a cord supply and then this aneurysmal dilatation going towards the cord. This is a rare case of a spinal dissecting aneurysm, i.e. Um, uh, um, an aneurysm of the posterior spinal artery at the transition of the, uh, of the segment that is uh, 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 fixated at the dura and the mobile segment in the subarachnoid space. And you can see nicely here, uh, this patient was treated with surgery, the disruption of the internal elastic lamina. But these spinal aneurysms can also be treated by endovascular means. Another example here, massive subarachnoid hemorrhage, focal outpouching, and here we see the dissecting aneurysm. And because these are non-shunting lesions, you can treat those by parent vessel occlusion because they are not shunting. And if you're not treating them, the prognosis is quite bad. So if you have a flow void in an extramedullary location, think about the rare case of a dissecting aneurysm. And now we can get really complex with the rare uh, muscular malformation because we not only have in the spinal cord the uh, radiculomedullary and the dural arteries, but we have many more arteries. We have, for example, the transition of the anterior spinal artery towards the phylum terminale. That's the artery of the phylum terminale. And if there's a shunt at the level of the uh, phylum terminale, then it's not an ASA supplied one because there is no cord beneath, which means that these are very easy to treat from an endovascular perspective because you just go all the way down, inject the glue, and then you are able to obliterate the shunt right here with preservation of the ASA. So if the feeding artery is an artery of the phylum terminale, it's something in between a dural and a pile shunt. It's called a phylum terminale, AB fistula. So we discussed about the dural arteries shunts, the pile arteries shunts, the deep versus the superficial ones, the artery of the phylum terminale, but we have many, many more arteries. 
So for example, here we have a paravertebral uh, arteriovenous shunt that is fed by arteries that would normally supply the bone. These are osteodural shunts. Or you can have an artery that would normally supply the nerve root. Then you can have a radicular shunt. If the shunt is right here. Or you can have a shunt that is located by these uh, uh, vessels. Then you have again a paravertebral artery shunt. Or you can have multiple shunts. Then we would have the so-called spinal arteriovenous metameric syndrome or COP syndrome, where we have multiple different shunts along a segment. And these are very difficult to treat. In fair case, here's a recent case that we uh, managed where we took out most of the supply that was leading to congestion, but still leaving at the end significant supply going towards the bone, whereas all of the cord supply was treated, as you can see here. Now, in these cases, we now do, uh, do uh, anti-angiogenic treatments where we do liquid biopsies, i.e. where we look at whether the patient has a mutation in the KRAS pathway, in the BRAF pathway, and then we would treat with, for example, tramitinib, which is what we did in this patient here, where we could not find any good uh, uh, arteries to treat. Here we believe that uh, maybe anti-angiogenic treatment is the treatment of choice in the future. So to summarize, and I'm sorry that I'm a little bit over time, I believe that as with any vascular uh, disease, we don't have to think about endovascular versus open. We have to think about us as a team. Uh, it is a multidisciplinary approach, uh, at least in our hospital. Uh, practices do vary at different institutions depending on the local experience and expertise. We may see in the future expanding roles uh, for uh, antiangiogenesis treatment. Um, in our uh, center, we do surgery for thoracic and upper lumbar spinal dural AV fistulas. For most lumbosacral dural AV fistulas, we uh, attempt an endovascular approach. For most fistulous ones, we attempt endovascular. For nidus type hemorrhagic ones, we use a very individualized approach. For non-hemorrhagic ones, we do not treat, and we do consider experimental antiangiogenic treatment for those AVMs that are symptomatic, but that we cannot treat by endovascular or surgical or combined roles. And with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Again, we uh, thank you for that excellent talk and review. Uh, we do have a couple questions from the chat. I'm going to let um, uh, Dr. Stepan start. Oh, uh, yeah, Dr. Greens, I'm Stefan Kipik. I'm one of the fellows uh, here in Swedish. It was absolutely phenomenal, mind-blowing talk. Thank you very much. It was the, just the, the, the pictures and the anatomy and uh, your knowledge of anatomy and how it shows, you know, that the, your imaging is only as good as your knowledge of anatomy. Um, I, have, I have some learning and studying to do. <laughs> but uh, I... Uh, have a question. What is your go-to system for catheterizing the a a ASA? And you know, and what's your margin of um, how much do you trust monitoring versus what's your kind of safety margin in in poten being potentially occlusive in critical vessels? Yeah. So my go-to uh, equipment is uh, still and has not changed uh, the Magic uh, One Point Two. It's the most, it's the softest and the most supple microcatheter. And since I use glue for those spinal vascular malformations rather than onyx um, and try to wedge myself, in most cases, I'm able to use the glue as if it was onyx because I'm in a wedged position. The problem with onyx is that you have reflux and your reflux margin, as I have indicated in some of the cases, is most of the time less than a millimeter because you're hooking into your sulcocommissural or into your radical pile from the ASA, and therefore there's very little security margin. In addition, all of the catheters that are used uh, for onyx, uh, squid, or fill, they are somewhat more stiffer. Um, 
I also use from a catheterization technique um, my wire only inside the catheter. My wire has a very sh very sharp tip so that when I put my wire into the magic tip to tip, the tip of the magic will actually make the curve. And when I now pull back, I can make the curve either there, like when I'm very much in front, it will be a very sh a stiff hook. And the more I now move away, the catheter will have less and less of a hook. And so you are able to get into various anatomy. Also, what I do in the cases that I have uh, showed you, if there's only like a small security margin and I have to go, go into a sarcomicrial artery that is not significantly dilated, I give through my magic before going into the sarcomicrial verapamil, typically one milligram, to make the vessel more soft and to prevent vasospasm. And the catheterization has to go smooth. If I see that I have too much pressure being built up, I actually um, be very, like very careful and rather take my entire system out because one of my colleagues had a devastating complication. He went forward, forward, forward. There was a lot of pressure being built up. He thought he was in a wedged position. He injected the glue because there was no, there was, he only had integrate flow. Injected the glue, wanted to pull, and he tore the entire anterior spinal artery because he was in vasospasm. And so the risk here is that if you uh, don't know that you are in vasospasm, you may think you are in a wedged position. Uh, and that is a major risk. So you have to be very careful when you are going into the vessels. And I am relatively liberal with giving, while I'm slowly going into the vessel of giving verapamil uh, like with small puffs uh, into the vessel so as to prevent uh, local vasospasm. Excellent. Dr. Monteith, did you have your hand raised? Sure. Thanks, Timo. That was a great talk as usual, um, kind of a, a tour de force of spinal AVMs, and we really, really appreciate it. I had a couple of technical questions. Um, you kind of covered one with regards to uh, using glue rather than onyx and it sounds like reflux is the major concern there um the the next question um uh, if you can elaborate a little bit uh on kind of onyx or fill versus um uh glue and if you ever use onyx um because uh, we tend to use onyx a little bit more for these lesions and then the second question is with regards to your your guide system do you do everything directly through a spinal access catheter or do you um, exchange for uh, something else that can um, go into the radicular artery or do you just directly use the the spinal which uh, often you can't really get good runs around thanks yeah thank you okay so glue versus onyx the major benefit of glue is uh, that it is thrombogenic so even if you get a little bit of glue into the venous pouch it often thromboses off uh, and uh, the major uh, benefit, of course, of onyx is that it goes into all of the different arteries, which for the spinal cord can actually cause a, a problem because there is a risk that it refluxes into other arteries um, and that therefore you may have inadvertent embolizations. I do use onyx in the rare uh, cases of, let's say, sacral or very low lumbar dural AV fistulas, where I know there is no supply to the cord and I'm still far away, and I don't get close enough for the glue to be able to penetrate into the vein, these would be the cases where I use onyx. Uh, but for most um, medullary or pile artery shunts, I would be a bit wary. Now, regarding um, the uh, devices, I like, uh, like a 38 uh, Cobra for most of my cases, and then use a wire to get the uh, 38 Cobra deep into the segmental artery, because in most cases, this gives me enough stability. Uh, but for some cases, like we had recently had uh, like a high flow fistula, I was actually able to get into the radicular medullary artery, a Fargo mini, just to have more support. So it all depends on the size of the vessel. The more support you have, the better, especially with tortuous <laughs> anatomy and where you have to go a long way. Um, but uh, if it's small vessels, I, I classically use a 38 uh, lumen uh, uh, five French uh, Cobra catheter. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, I think um, Cameron, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I just want to add my, uh, you know, appreciation and congratulations. Uh, you know, the great teachers make these complex things look simple and and add clarity to our minds. And I do always learn something when I when I listen to you talk. So I really appreciate uh, the quality of your teaching and images and the whole thing. Uh, a couple of questions. Um, you know, the glue really is something that that is very difficult to teach and uh, for people to get experience with. What are, what do you how dilute is the glue that you're using uh, when you do use it on the on the fish that's in the AVMs? Yeah, so it depends again on the high uh, on the uh, uh, fistulous flow, and there is no really good cooking recipe. And uh, I agree, it is one of the things uh, that uh, we should really work on uh, to find some type of model where we can teach glue injections, uh, uh, because I still believe that they do have a role for some diseases. So if I have a high flow uh, macro fistula, I classically use uh, undiluted glue that I mix with tantalum powder. If I have a low flow fistula, then I use uh, only 30% uh, uh, glue with 70% uh, uh, lipidol. Um, so it really depends on the flow rate of the fistula and how close uh, I am to uh, the shunting point. Um, uh, but I do not experiment too much with anything in between. So I have three classical uh, concentrations that that's 50-50, the nearly undilute or 100% glue, or like the 30% for the really slow flow one. And I believe what we, like there, there are now um, uh, like, some some models out there, 3D printing is now more and more possible. There may be with variations of flows and variations of arteriovenous transition, we can try to teach on a model uh, um, uh, physicians uh, using uh, using uh, glue as an embolic agent, but it is um, it is still not it's still very difficult to teach this. I I fully agree. Just a couple of follow-ons on on when you're getting into the subcommissural. I mean, you're I I call it the landing zone. You call it the safety margin. It is so small. If you have if you're not completely wedged, um, do you proceed because the the, the margin for reflux is you know basically zero in, in those subcommissural arteries. So if I'm not wedged, I would err on the uh, more conservative side for sure because in the moment where you have reflux that would be a devastating complication so in these cases presumably I would try to uh, wedge more by giving just like a little bit of a nudge to the microcatheter to be able to uh, just even uh, if this nudge pushes down this will allow the vessel to actually close off because the, the angle will now get steeper you can't get a little bit yeah Exactly. Um, and then uh, switching subjects a little bit, um, we used to be obsessive on our spinal angiograms, the dural fistulas, uh, at at ensuring that we'd capture it every level, and you know, especially for the rare case where there might be two two fistulas or two sites, and and you know, we we lost sleep at night over that, worrying that we might have missed a level in some of these atherosclerotic difficult patients. Do you, do you think the uh, time-resolved MR now allows you to really be more focal uh, and, and not do the complete spinal angio? Yeah, so at least in our institution, that is what we're doing, exactly uh, for the reason that you're saying. These are often elderly male patients, and they uh, often have difficult uh, aortas. So we use the, uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, non-invasive uh, non MRA to kind of pinpoint, okay, this appears to be T12 or T11, but it appears to be on the left side. So we go there, we would do one level above, one level below, the contralateral side uh, for the neurosurgeons to see whether in, uh, in close vicinity there's the anterior spinal artery, but we would only do a targeted uh, um, spinal angiography. There are case reports out there for metachronous development of multiple spinal dural AV fistulas, i.e. you treat one spinal dural AV fistula patient did better, 
a couple of years later, he's deteriorating again, and we see a new dural arteriovenous fistula. But these are case reportable rare. Uh, likewise, multiple dural arteriovenous fistula, case reportable rare. Therefore, I do not think that we need to necessarily do every single level in every single patient. I kind of like to, um, if I see that it's likely thoracic, I do this under local so uh, that the patient has no stress from the anesthesia and I just take like the few vessels in the moment where I find it, I will try to find also a Demkovich. Uh, uh, and if I don't find a Demkovich, the level above, the level below, contralateral level, I know that the surgeon will not have a problem uh, there. And I I don't necessarily actually now uh, break a leg for uh, finding it. Yeah. Um, and then in the follow-up of that, I mean, I've, I've become more limited as well and, and trust on the resolution of edema uh, to, to help me in the early stage. You know, patients often aren't recovering that much or aren't recovering as fast as, as you think they might or should. And so I, I look for the edema on the follow-up MR. How reliable a thing do you think is that as, as a way of following up? I think, um, as you said, uh, clinical parameters alone are not uh, sufficient uh, because um, uh, some patients even continue to deteriorate despite uh, uh, their, their, their treatment because uh, the fistula was there for too long a time and, and there is just like cord atrophy. Um, uh, but in general, the most typical course, and one of our previous fellows, Dr. Sean O'Reilly, is actually looking at uh, 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 our data currently, is that if a patient is treated, he has a new baseline and then slowly gets better. And we classically only do a follow-up if the patient, after getting better, deteriorates again. That, I think, is the major point to look after especially if you have done an embolization and you are not 100% sure whether you reach the vein because these patients will get initially better, but then new vessels will start to recruit and they will get worse predictably. So in these cases, you have to be just very honest to yourself. Do a CT and if you see that the glue or the onyx is not in the vein, this patient will deteriorate and those have to be treated then early on. And the last thing I want to just uh, check with you on is is that that case you showed where the, with the um, anterior and posterior spinal arteries coming out of the same level that sort of changed your practice. I, um, don't you think that 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 was a, a, a segmental artery injection? Don't you think that had you gone and put a microcatheter in there that you would have seen the, the posterior spinal artery? Okay, so uh, we have now, um, I had one more patient that I treated that was a thoracic one, and uh, I treated the patient, and I looked at the anatomy, and I went actually with my microcatheter in there. It was during the time where we were still doing uh, this as primary uh, embolization targets. I did inject. I did a forceful injection. I was just in front of... Um, the, uh, uh, the the fistula, and even in retrospect, I didn't see anything. So there was one more case that I had, and then Carl had one case that actually became a, a lawsuit where he had exactly the same thing. Where and Carl is uh, like grandmaster in uh, spinal vascular anatomy, and even in retrospect, you can't see it. So we now have three cases. And so when I discussed this with uh, another previous fellow of ours, uh, uh, Stephanie Lenk, who worked with Emmanuel Houda in Paris, um, she said what Emmanuel Houda does in every single thoracic and uh, um, like upper lumbar spinal dural AV fistula is he does a vaso CT and floods the vessel with contrast. And with this, you see even the smallest cord supply. So that's something that um, we have not attempted here, but it does make sense. And so I would recommend uh, for those of, like for those on the call who are uh, doing dural uh, fistula embolization, if you are doing a thoracic or an upper lumbar one, 
and you don't see any cord supply, you may think about a vase of CT because like this, you will flood all the vas vessels and you will be able to see, that's what she said. And I, I, I do believe her because Emanuele Huda, again, one of the grandmasters in spinal vascular anatomy to whom I really look up, um, they find all of the supply there. And I think that this would be a safe way to do it. In our experience, yeah. it's just such an easy surgery for the surgeon. And uh, uh, therefore, at, at our institution, we, we, we do a lot of surgery for these cases still. Yeah, I 100% agree that the, the low threshold for, for flipping to surgery is, is appropriate. Um, but it sounds like I've been lucky uh, so far. And, and uh, I'm glad you caught me before I did something bad. Uh, I, I just have one more question, Timo. Um, do you ever do, uh, people have described doing a, a super selective WADA test or, or putting amatol into uh, um, super selective vessels, uh, branches off the ASA, et cetera, um, with questions about reliability? Do you or your group, do you ever do that or have any comments on that? I have never done this. Uh, I've heard about it, but uh, I have never personally done it. Our group is not doing it, um, and so I, I, I don't, I, I, I don't feel uh, um, uh, like knowledgeable enough to say anything about this. Thank you. In the, in, in the very dark distant past, I did that for a while, and it was, it was just painful, unreliable, and I ended up using it mostly when I didn't want to embolize something. I would prove that that there was a deficit by injecting a little harder yeah <laughs> push as hard as you can so it goes everywhere yeah it was just it was just it just was too much pain too little gain well we've kept you over time um and really enjoyed it and as always real pleasure spending time with you and uh, i think we've all learned a lot today and and uh that's a beautiful talk that uh other people hopefully can go back and review. I know uh, some of it went by pretty fast for some of us, and it's great to have it there that we can look at it again. So thank you so much. Really thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Krings. Okay.